All right, can we use one of yours? We just won't have our closing today. Uh, what's next? It's this lecture, yeah. And this lecture is some serious magic later. How does this work for yours? Okay. Okay, last self-regulation perspective, and also one that um, I want to tell you to give you hope and motivation to engage in self-regulation. So just like I wanted to give a fair and balanced perspective of ego depletion, wanting to leave you with the notion that there are ways to override ego depletion effects, there are, in fact, data suggesting that self-control at times, resisting temptations, can actually become so practiced that they become automatic. And we know what automatic means. Automatic means low resources involved, very low effort. That self-control over time can actually occur automatically without using any of the resources um, that you have. So how does this work? The idea is that over time and with practice, certain self-regulatory strategies can be automatized. One example of this is temptations and goals, okay? Let's say my goal is to lose weight, okay? Lose weight, lose weight. I think about it all the time, now I need to lose weight. Um, things that tempt me and derail me from that goal are really sweet, yummy desserts and fried foods, okay? And when I see sweet, yummy desserts and fried foods, often comes to mind, like, oh man, I, I want to lose weight, I shouldn't eat them. Oh man, I gotta lose weight, I can't eat that fried food, or crap, I can't order dessert. The point being that over time, I often think about temptations and my goal to lose weight at the same time, okay? One often brings the other to mind. So the idea is that temptations and goals over time become connected in memory, just like nurse and doctor, bacon and eggs, okay, Bert and Ernie, okay, they often become um, connected in mind, so that bringing to mind one of those concepts might bring to mind the other. What would be particularly adaptive and what research has shown to be the case is that when you flash people with words reflecting their temptations, what comes to mind automatically are thoughts about their goals. Cake, lose weight. Chocolate chip cookie, lose weight. French fries, lose weight. Okay, without any effort exerted on my part. It's like this little automatic reminder, because you've associated the two so often, you know, you, you think about that temptation, lose weight, ah, lose weight, okay, is the idea. And even more incredibly, okay, they have shown that bringing to mind your goal, man, I want to lose weight, decreases the accessibility of cake and cookies and fried food. How awesome is that? Okay, awesome, right. It makes the temptation slower to come to mind when goals are brought to mind first. You bring temptations to mind first, goals are right there. You bring goals to mind, cake is trying to come there, but it's slower. Okay? They show this through reaction time. They show people on the screen words related to their goals or words related to their temptations. Temptations and participants are asked to respond as quickly as possible to these words, some sort of judgment task. And they've shown this asymmetry in the action times. Temptations bring to mind goals readily. Goals suppress the accessibility of temptations. Now, before you go walking out of this room going, ha, cool, but I'm all set. I don't have to worry about anything. This is just going to happen automatically. Yeah, it doesn't happen automatically for everybody. Okay? It's people who've had a lot of practice at this, who are really motivated to meet their goals, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not off the hook. You've got to practice this kind of thing for this thing to get um, actually working. Let me give you a second example that I think is cooler because it actually involves, to some degree, behavior. Okay? So in the study, participants are once again shown on the computer screen words related to their goals. So let's say lose weight, to get a good grade, what have you, and words related to temptations, like yummy desserts and fried foods. They're told when they see these words come up on the screen, either to push a lever away from them every time they see a word, bam, pull, push it away, or pull a lever towards you every time you see a word on the screen. Okay? So they see a goal and then a temptation, push or pull, depending on what they're instructed to see a temptation, goal, whatever, push and pull. They're instructed to do one of those two things. Okay, pushing. Do we push things away that we want or that we don't want? That's right. We push things, we avoid, we get the hell away from. Pull, we pull things toward us, approach. You see where this is going a little bit? Okay? Here are the data. They're looking at speed with which you push and pull these, knock off or pull towards you these words on the screen. Okay, let me orient you. These on, the, um, on the, your left, these are the folks who are asked to push the lever. Okay, higher numbers means it took them longer. Okay, so participants who are asked to push, it takes them the longest to push away goal words. It takes, they're really fast, relatively speaking, to push away temptation words. Okay, bam, get out of here. Goal, okay, I'm supposed to push, and I'm doing it slower, compared to neutral words that are in the middle. Participants who are told when they see words, they have to pull it toward them, that's their task, pull it toward you. When it is a goal, the solid bar, the dark bar, yeah, quickly, come to me, come to me, diet, come to me, good grade, whatever. When I see cake, okay, I, when I see cake, I'm slower to pull it toward me. Get it? I'm slower to approach the temptations, I'm, I'm faster to approach the goal. When I'm trying to shove things away from me, I'm really good at shoving away temptations and not so wanting to shove away my goals. Are you with me? Okay, the idea there is, you know, it presumably corresponds to actual approach and avoidance behaviors. You know, running to go get the cake or running to go work out to lose weight or what have you. Being eager to or not eager to. Okay, again, this is not, this is great news that things can, self-control can be automatized, but again, this is something like anything that gets automa automatized that takes practice. So it's not, it doesn't take you off the hook, okay? Okay, that's all I wanted to say about self-regulation. And we're going to move in our last probably three minutes. Oh, great, we have more. Okay, 14 minutes um, to um, the next topic, but we're going to see when we get to here in a second. Oh man, I hope it's the right version. Okay, folks, we are in lecture four of the second unit of the course, which means we're halfway through, okay? We've covered the self in rather a lot of depth. Where does self-knowledge come from? Um, uh, how is self-knowledge organized? Why does that matter? You know, that we present the self, that there's motivational underpinnings of the self, it influences our self-evaluative um, kinds of behaviors, and it influences self-regulation. Now we're going to shift gears a little to the middle topic of this second unit of the course. It has to do with attitudes, okay? We're going to talk about attitudes and behavior and behavior and attitudes, and then we're going to talk about how to change attitudes, in other words, how to persuade people to change people's attitudes. But before we can do any of all that, we need to first lay out what the heck is an attitude, okay? I'm not talking about he has a bad attitude. I'm talking about your attitudes, your opinions, your stances on objects in the world, political issues, your best friend, your enemy, what have you. So if you can think about an attitude, here's a fancy definition, as a psychological tendency, so like a schema, it's psychological, we're assuming it exists, we know it exists, we know we have positive and negative attitudes toward nearly everything out there in the world, um, that we express this attitude by valuing something with some degree of positivity or negativity. 
Okay, favorable or unfavorable. I am pro-abortion. I am anti-capital punishment. Okay, those are attitudes I have towards the political issues. I am pro my psychology professor. I'm anti my chemistry professor. Okay, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's psychological, like a schema. Okay, and you're going to ask if it's like a schema, and it, it could be like a schema. But what's critical about an attitude is that it necessarily had an evaluative flavor, flavor for it, to it. Okay, some schemas might not have much evalu evaluation to it. You might not particularly tag it with much favorability or unfavorability. Attitudes, by definition, are evaluative tendencies. More than that. Um, Attitudes can have as many as three different kinds of components, okay? They can have a cognitive component, beliefs about the positive or negative. So again, we're talking about evaluation. It's not just beliefs, neutral beliefs, like, you know, my mom's hair is short. That is a neutral belief, to me at least, okay? Beliefs that are related to my attitude are going to be, my mom is very loving. That is a clearly positive belief I have about my mother. My mom is very unsupportive. That is a negative belief that is part of my attitude toward my mother. There could be affective components of your attitude. I love my mother. I hate my mother. Positive and negative feelings associated with your attitude toward the attitude object, in this example, my mother. And there could be behavioral elements to your attitudes, okay? I call my mom every day. Okay, a favorable behavior, part of my attitude, favorable attitude toward my mom, or I try to avoid my mom at all costs. Okay, I hang up on her all the time. These are negative behaviors, part of my negative attitude about my mother. Okay, attitudes can have all of these components, but I think oftentimes it's the case that, you know, your attitudes may have one of these components more developed than others. For example, my attitude towards cilantro is negative, but it's very primarily affectively and behaviorally based. I know nothing belief-wise about cilantro. I can say it's green, but that's not really evaluative. Okay, but affectively, I feel disgust towards cilantro, and behaviorally, I stay the heck away from it. Okay, uh, my attitude toward computers is very positive. Okay, but it's very, I'm not a Mac user, I don't have a lot of emotion associated with my laptop, except right now, which I hate it, um, but um, my attitude towards my car, technology products, are very neutral, affectively, very much cognitively based. Okay, it's about, does it work, is it reliable, you know, yes, no, I'm not that emotionally involved towards it. Okay, so different attitudes can have different bases that are more or less developed. Children's attitudes, okay, because maybe they haven't had that much experience with a certain attitude object, like let's say minority group members, members of a group other than their own, might be very affectively based. Something they just pick up from their parents, we don't like those people. Okay, but they don't have a lot of beliefs, and they haven't engaged in a lot of behaviors in relation to this group. Okay? So attitudes, while they can have all these components, and many do, sometimes it's the case that one component of an attitude is more developed than another. So I'm just going to quickly show this as another example. Your attitude um, about dentists might have cognitions, beliefs you have. You know, dentists are friendly, dentists are expensive. Those are beliefs you have. Evaluative, friendly is good, expensive is bad. Affect, emotions you might associate with being your attitude toward dentists. They make me feel anxious. I always feel pain at the dentist. I cannot think of anything positive feeling-wise to think about dentists personally. Maybe you can. Um, behaviors. I visit the dentist once a year. I'm a very cooperative patient. Um, or I never schedule my appointment. What have you? Different kinds of behaviors that feed into your attitude or that reflect your positive or negative attitude about dentists. Okay. Just a, a silly example. You can come up um, with your own. Okay, what I want to get to first is this question, which you might be looking at me like, what's the question? Do attitudes that you have that could have all these different components, do they predict subsequent behavior? So if I have a positive attitude toward my sister, is that going to predict positive behavior toward my sister? You're probably all thinking, of course it is. Okay, if you have a positive attitude toward your social psychology class, is that going to predict you taking good notes and studying for the exam? Of course it is. Okay, you hate cilantro like I do, is that going to predict you cursing cilantro and avoiding it at all costs? Cost, of course it is. Attitudes, here's a, here's a really good one. If you're a Democrat, did you go vote for Obama? Of course you did. If you're a Republican, did you make sure not to vote for Obama? Of course you did. Of course attitudes predict behavior, right? Okay, yeah, sometimes they do, but you'd be surprised at how often they don't. Okay, so the classic example given in social psychology for the counterintuitive notion that attitudes don't always predict behavior is described in your textbook as a study done by LaPierre. I don't even think he was a social psychologist, but back in the 1930s, LaPierre, Pierre, um, went around, the 1930s in the United States, there was a lot of prejudice against people from Asian countries, known then as Orientals, like the rug. Okay, this is what Asians were thought of then in the 1930s, a lot of prejudice. And LaPierre went around the country visiting all kinds of different establishments, restaurants, hotels, motels, and so forth, with a very well dressed Asian couple, clearly Asian couple. And they were served at several hundred of these establishments. After they went on their tour of the country, getting treated fairly well, not with prejudice, actually, he sent a survey to all of the establishments that they visited and asked if they would serve Orientals. Okay? An enormously high percentage, above 90% said no way. Okay? Their attitudes are very negative against Orientals. Okay? But their behavior did not follow those attitudes. They had served these people. Okay? They had welcomed this Chinese couple. What the heck's going on here? I thought if you're Democrat, you'd necessarily vote in ways that are consistent with the Democrat. You know, or act Democrat. You know, if you like the person, aren't you always going to act in favorable ways for that person? Vice versa, if you don't like them? Why is it the case that sometimes attitudes don't predict behaviors? You're going to read about um, various um, reasons why this might be the case in your textbook, um, but let me go over some of the ones I find particularly compelling and useful to go over here in class. Here's one reason why attitudes might not always predict behaviors. We just talked about how attitudes can have multiple components to them. What I didn't make obvious is that those components might not be evaluatively consistent. You could have positive affects but negative beliefs. I love eating french fries, they make me happy. I have very negative beliefs about the health consequences of eating french fries. Okay, this leads to a state of ambivalence. So that even though I'm kind of anti-french fries, you will see me eating them quite often, okay? My attitudes are not predicting my behaviors. Okay, so you might have positive cognitions about dentists but negative affect associated with dentists. What's gonna win at the particular moment? We don't know, okay? You might have positive affect associated with eating fried food as I clearly do, but negative cognitions, beliefs about fried food, okay? Leading to my overall attitude for fried food to sometimes predict my behavior, sometimes not, okay? So there could be a value of inconsistency among the components of an attitude that make it so that your attitude doesn't, your overall attitude doesn't always predict behavior. Okay, a second reason um, of the two that I'll go through in the lecture is that and this is the case, this is probably likely the case in the LaPierre Oriental couple example. Um, oftentimes when we assess people's attitudes, we're assessing them at a pretty general level, um, a pretty broad level, not a very specific level. level. For example, how do you feel about Orientals in general? That's more or less what the survey was asking them. Not how you feel about this well-dressed, very polite Oriental couple accompanied by this Caucasian man. Okay? If they had been asked, those um, owners of those establishments have been asked specifically, how do you feel about this well-dressed couple, this well-dressed polite couple, attitudes may have predicted behaviors more, but that's not what they were asked. Okay? So in the other examples here, you might have a prejudiced negative attitude toward Muslims in general, but not your Muslim roommate. 
So your general negative attitude toward Muslims is not predicting your roommate attitude, your attitude and behaviors toward your specific roommate. You might have a very positive attitude towards safe sex. Safe sex is a good thing. I have a positive attitude. But I don't have a very positive attitude about going to purchase condoms at the local Walgreens where all fellow students are. Okay? And if you ask me what my attitude is toward purchasing condoms at the local Walgreens where all the students are present, it will be negative and it will correlate with my behavior of not doing that. But if you ask me what my attitude is for safe sex and then measure whether I go buy condoms, it's, it's not that surprising perhaps then that attitudes don't always predict behaviors. You've got to have a match in the level of generality specificity of the attitude you're measuring and the behaviors that you are assessing to see if they are predicted by those attitudes. Okay? So in the case of the Oriental couple, again, they're assessing the broad attitudes toward Orientals, not toward the specific um, individual. Um, let's see. Okay, we will pick up with cognitive dissonance theory on Monday, which turns the table around and asks the question, can behaviors lead to attitudes?